Okay, my watch says seven o'clock. Welcome everybody. Um, happy holidays. Thanks for attending this uh, special board session, special holiday board session to take care of the month of uh, December. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, in deference to Nicole's statement, um, I understand there's nobody from the public to be heard. So we'll move past item two in the agenda and go to item three, approval of minutes from November 16th meeting. Do I have um, any questions or concerns to um, address before we move to approve the meeting? Kathy? Um, I found there was a, at least in the copy that I received it, it's what appeared to be a typo in the, it was in the section for the library director's report, part C. It reads 89 Wi-Fi hotspots can now me checked. So it just B. probably needs to be changed to B. Yes. So since that was the PDF version, Nancy, should I, I go can the doc version and change it and send it to you yeah again. yes that'd be great thank you and then do we need to amend the minutes to reflect the online vote that we did um uh, we'll talk about that when i get to the empson fund thing because we may we may end up just voting again tonight because we haven't released a check yet so okay that's fine thank you then we have uh we have new wording for uh the group to look at so when we get to that and maybe you can just roll it back in or, or make it part of this um, night's uh, minutes. So with that correction, uh, do I have a motion to approve these minutes? Nobody wants to step forward and approve these minutes? Uh, I'll move to approve the minutes as amended. I'll second. I'm, I'm gonna miss you, Katie. <laughs> She's still here. I'm staying. I'm staying. Hey. I changed my mind. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Cynthia? I'll second. Thank you. All in favor, raise their hands. I believe it's unanimous. So uh, with that, consider the minutes for the November 16th meeting approved. Okay, uh, then on to our normal items. Um, Nancy, you have the floor. Okay, hi everybody. Um, we are pretty busy as I was kind of chatting before we started the meeting. Um, our curbside numbers continue to increase. Um, I think our previous curbside high had been around 300. Now I think our average daily curbside is about 375. So we're up at more than one per minute. And the hours were open and I think last Monday we hit over 500. So um, Monday morning and Wednesday at one, since Wednesdays are late day are crazy. Um, a lot of folks waiting to get their stuff. So people have really caught on to putting things on hold, definitely. Um, we have added, since we don't have other folks in the lobby, we have a mishmash of added shelving now that we've put on because our hold shelves were overflowing and all of us shift those shelves just about every day. Our, our holds limits are still at 10 per card um, at this point. We will increase that if we can later, but right now we're just absolutely overflowing with holds. So um, even though we've had a few patron questions about why museums just reopened and why we haven't reopened to browsing, we have a whole different situation going there. Um, you know, they are just, they just have folks that are browsing exhibits and not touching things and, and, and mingling and checking things out. So we, our plan is to stay with curbside as long as we're still in the red zone. And then we'll, we're, you know, if once we, once things improve, we'll certainly look at, at opening back up to browsing. Um, we are seeing some computer users. We do have some short stations that are available by appointment. Those have been used fairly frequently and we have a fair amount of patrons who are taking advantage of being able to print remotely from their devices so helped a lot of people do that um 
for those folks who need to use computers for a longer period of time uh, for job applications or other applications for insistence or just just longer than we have available at Lockup. We have now through the CARES Act funding, I think we have 223 of them so far, Chromebooks sitting in our lobby, waiting to be cataloged and putting in the system. Um, all 89 hotspots are in the system. So very shortly we'll be able to check out Chromebooks from not just the library's location, but we'll have some located at, at I think the housing authority and some located at children, youth and families and we're figuring out what goes where at this point. The library will be cataloging them all and keeping track of them. So we do have some that will be located in other locations um, and we have charging carts that go with them. Um, CARES Act funding, which is all linked to providing service during COVID. Through that, we also have up and running for when patrons return, a couple of secure phone charging stations. We've had some issues in the past with folks coming in and not having any place to charge their phones, sticking them any, in any wall out that they can find, walking away and having the phones walk away. So we have an upstairs version and a downstairs version of six cute little lockers that people uh, make an electronic code for, stick their phone in on the, char on the charger and they can lock it while they use the library, come back and retrieve it. We've also received 20 something, I think it's 21 play, the play away launch pads. Those are like, um, smart tablets that do not require Wi-Fi on a wide variety of topics. They have preloaded software on everything from preschool learning to ACT and SAT practice tests. And those can be checked out and used, like I said, with no Wi-Fi connection. We've also received some rolling on rollers screens that will be used to uh, better separate our computers upstairs once we reopen to the public up there. So a little, a little extra barrier, um, assuming that COVID will be a risk for some time. Uh, another COVID Act, another CARES Act funding item we'll be receiving soon is a much better color copier printer scanner. We've been working with City Purchasing, uh, with Pam in Purchasing, who's been amazing. We had been leasing copiers for years and years and years from, from a business and paying to lease the copiers and they came and emptied all the money from the copiers. And we had questioned that before, Pam was working with us so that we don't plan to make money off of our copiers, but we plan to at least break even. So um, copiers actually taken quite a bit of money and we were not recouping any of that previously, but we will be having new color copiers, printers, scanners, you can you can scan materials directly to your email, et cetera, print things. Um, they'll have good capabilities and people can also print to those from home and pick things up curbside. So uh, probably our last item for the CARES Act funding is from a company called Mozio and it's text a librarian. So I've used this product before. I don't know if we talked about this before, but it is just another way for people to obtain ref reference service and to contact and chat with the library. So Pretty soon there's a, there's a chat program. You'll have a, a probably a five digit number that you'll use to um, type into your phone and you can text real time with library with librarians and get information about your account, reference service, anything via chat. So it was popular a while back in libraries. And I think we're seeing a resurgence in popularity of the texting programs. A lot of folks now would, I know my kids never call anybody if they can possibly text them and a lot of folks do. And also a lot of people do have a phone where they may not have complete internet access. So those are some CARES Act funding things that are piled up in our lobby that we'll be instituting pretty quickly. Um, other than that, we're working on year end everything. We're always you know, ban balancing our budget, um, trying to spend as, as much of everything as we can without going over. So we have our, um, Inter our internal departments that all have their wish lists. So I told people at the end of the year, you know, here you go, stop spending on this, but but compile your wish list and we'll see what purchases we can cram in. Um, year end, working on year end staff reviews, um, working on our year end salary spreadsheets. At this point, it looks like um, the market rate has not moved for the next year, but we are allowed to bring employees who are below 101% of market rate up to market rate. And we are allowed to 
um, nominate a small amount of our staff for possible exceptional pay. And it, this was the toughest time to figure out who should be given exceptional pay, because honestly, there aren't any of our staff this year who didn't go above and beyond. Um, I, I can't even tell you what, what people have done this year that's, that's above and beyond. And you know, we have staff working, doing all kinds of jobs that are nowhere even represented at all in their job descriptions, et cetera, and doing it under um, less, than, less than optimal circumstances. So um, that's most of what I had. Like I said, we're just in that year end frenzy of, of trying to get everything in by the deadlines. So the last day we can pretty much spend any money for this fiscal year is, is the 18th. So we're looking at having to get everything in before Friday. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, one, one observation and one question. When you look down to read your notes, we lose your, okay. your commentary. I'll hold, I'll hold them up here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I lose it anyway. <laughs> and then my, my, my question is, is all the additional electronics you've been able to secure, is that from CARES or did that it is. the year in budget? That's from CARES Act funding. Great. And then you don't have to pay that back in next year's. No, we don't. And, you know, the, the object of it was really trying to find um, some expenditures that would really do something to help um, not eliminate, but close that digital divide. And you know, we always talk about the digital divide, but we've never seen anything like what COVID will do. So, um, you know, normally we definitely have the haves and have nots with technology and the people who are more tech, um, technically proficient than others. But now we have, you know, entire segments of the population that have been completely cut off that don't have internet access. So, um, you know, the gaps only widened. So trying to look at, at more and more ways to communicate with folks who don't have have Wi-Fi or internet technology, and also other ways to keep in touch with and provide services for people who do, but who are stuck at home. Great. So that's what we were looking for. Great. Any other questions for Nancy? Cynthia? Yes, Nancy, you may have touched on this and apologies if I missed it in an earlier meeting. But I noticed on the website that you had an update about Prospector. Yes, um, we do. That's, that's something that's not the best news for us. Um, we are not going to be using Prospector during this next year. And that was a consortium wide decision. Um, we probably could have squeaked it out on our own, but we, you know, we're in there as a consortium and their, their costs are high. Um, because we are composed of five separate libraries, even though between all of us, we have what, eight branches, I think we pay triple the amount of Denver Public, of Jefferson County, et cetera. So we pay really high costs for a prospector. So unfortunately it is something that we had to um, let go this year. We have a lot of patrons who use it, but luckily we have a really crackerjack ILL service through our library. So we think we'll be able to accommodate our patrons through interlibrary loan. So we've beefed up, we've moved a couple of the folks that were dealing with prospector items over to assisting with interlibrary loan. So the difference for those who don't know what that is, prospector um, basically gives patrons at quick access to materials from libraries in Colorado and, and some in Wyoming as well. So it is pretty quick because it's a smaller geographic area. We have always had interlibrary loan, but we're expanding that to cover this year when we don't have prospects or an interlibrary loan can come from anywhere in this country and it actually from other countries as well. So unlike some other library systems, we're not charging for interlibrary loans. You can really get pretty much anything from all over the country. It just, it'll just take longer than prospector did because it won't be a local delivery. How much so of your would you guess came from prospector? What's that, Mike? What's that? How, how much of your borrowings came from? Um, I'm trying to think how many things we borrowed last year. I think we borrowed about 6,000 items total through Prospector, but some of those items are available, you know, elsewhere too. So we are capping. We have some folks who, who really, really are power users of Prospector. And, and, you know, those folks would get in just tons and tons and tons of material and then kind of look through it or not pick up part of it too. So um, 
you know, that could be a little problematic too, if stuff is being delivered back and forth and the people, you know, really don't want it. So we're hoping that people will be a little bit more selective if we're putting some limits on this year. And um, I think that we'll have maybe a little leverage to do a little bargaining in the future potentially, um, because we are by far a net lender. We have a really excellent collection and we lend out by far more than we borrow. So, um, you know, hopefully everybody's financial picture in our consortium will will improve to the point where we'll be able to have it back at some point because it is a good service for our patrons. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Nancy? Okay, uh, friends report. Okay, <clears throat> my report is on the board meeting that occurred December 2nd via Zoom. Membership in friends is reported at 470 members. Uh, we were reminded that patrons are able to purchase from the lobby bookshop and the gift shop using either check or cash. And then they use the curbside delivery service uh, to pick up their item. And this is all occurring now during this restricted access in December. If you want complete instructions, just visit the friends website and they tell you exactly what to do. Uh, you contact them to make sure the item is there and then uh, bring a check or cash to the curbside pickup. The sales were reported for October were $1,418.15 in the bookshop. They had sold $374.36 on eBay or online sales and $59.90 at the gift shop. The treasurer, Lynn Newberry, reported transferring $34,000 out of one of their CDs that was up for renewal the end of November. And this will provide them operating funds for the friends until the book sales can resume. Uh, the board will be evaluating a membership and donor database called Wild Apricot on a 30-day trial. This is um, this month. The product they're looking at, it will provide member and donor management, email and letter communication, an integrated website development, and also a store function. So they will evaluate it and a decision to, uh, to purchase it would be made via email. Excuse and me, Kathy. Are you, are you aware, um, Catherine, that your notes are up on the screen? as you edit them? Is that supposed to be Kathy's report? Sorry, I must have chosen the wrong tab. My all right. I no was problem, to, it, no problem. It's all and I made it harder. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry that's all right, I'm, yeah. The next meeting is scheduled for January 27th, 2021. And that's all I have. Okay, any questions for Kathy? Okay, uh, City Council Liaison Report, please. Thanks, Mark. Uh, real quickly, just building on the last part of Nancy's report, or part of Nancy's report, in terms of the number of Chromebooks and the electronics you, Mark, you were asking about. On the other side of town, LPC, my mom, power and communications um, and next light are really dedicated uh, to in ensuring that we have no families, especially with young children in Longmont without connectivity. Uh, so kind of parallel to what um, what Nancy's been able to do, Longmont power and communications can identify families, at least eight of them just recently uh, with children between the ages of zero and five who have never been connected to the Internet. Those families have 17 children. Uh, who are now connected and can take advantage of those Chromebooks or the other the other electronics that the library is able to provide. So, uh, you know, big picture, um, what what's happening during the pandemic, mm -hmm. as difficult as it, it's been long term, there are going to be a lot of people much better served, mm -hmm. I think, in the long run, because of the innovation and how we've deployed both human and digital resources um, mm -hmm. under these re remarkable circumstances. So that's just a bit of good news, right? In a, in a year of a lot of bad news. 
So here are some things that are going on. You tell me if you have questions about them and I'll come back to them. These are the kind of out of the ordinary things. Uh, federal court uh, two days ago dismissed a suit that was uh, prohibiting progress on the construction of the Chimney, Hollow, Chimney Hollows Reservoir, part of the firming project for the Windy Gap um, uh, uh, initiative. Uh, so if you have questions, I'm happy to come back to that. Number one, number two, um, uh, we get it. We get information from Jim Golden, our chief financial officer, about we get reports all the time on a regular basis in terms of sales tax revenues, use tax revenues, what's happening in terms of the city's financial uh, situation. Um, and I, it's a pretty interesting story, I think, how effectively Jim and his staff and then all of the city team has managed city resources during this pandemic. We, as we approach the end of the year, it's an untold story about how good, how, uh, how effective the stewardship has been uh, and how effectively the city staff has shepherded resources that gets us to the end of the year um, in much better financial shape than, than I think anybody imagined we might have experienced back in, in March. Uh, we have an item on the, on, the, on the agenda tomorrow night that uh, is a letter to Weld County Commissioners and a resolution that goes along with that. Um, I don't know where we'll end up with that tomorrow night, but that's on the agenda. Uh, coming after the first of the year, our short-term uh, rentals ordinance that a number of people have some interest in. We've got an open forum on January 19th. This group will have met again. I No, well, we won't have met again before January 19th, will we? No. Uh, so if you're interested or your friends are interested, we we passed um, on the open forum in the in June because we could, we could only do it virtually. And we decided that we would go ahead and take a shot at doing a virtual open forum on January 19th. Probably one of the, the, two, the two most fun council meetings of the year are the open forums. So I'm glad that we have a chance to go back to the open forum, even if it's gonna be virtual and see what kind of um, interest we can generate. Uh, the last, you know, kind of what's coming in the new year would be um, among a number of capital projects, the, we're going to start to see the construction on railroad crossings and the creation of quiet zones through the city. So if you have interest in any of those, I'll follow up. If not, those are the kind of things on the horizon for the council that may have some impact on you. Any questions for Councilman Waters? You get a break tonight, Councilman. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm not, I, I might weigh in on some of these other items. <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> It's fine. Okay. Um, then let's, uh, with, if there are no further questions, let's move on to old business. Um, one of the items that came up between meetings was a, a request to um, spend some money on the, from the Epson fund, which the uh, board had agreed to, but for purposes of, um, I guess, proper stewardship of, of those assets and to notify the public. We um, we're going to formally pass the request tonight. And if no, Nicole, if you can put that up for everyone to see, Kathy went back in her notes and looked up um, how we said this sort of thing in the past. And uh, all I did was copy her information and, and put it out there for all to see. So I'll give you a second to, to read through it. And if anybody has any questions or concerns, uh, please, please raise your hand. Otherwise I will move to um, get a motion to approve. Kathy? Nancy, I just want to confirm that we have the correct number of encyclopedia. This, this is correct. And this is exactly the wording of the last motion. And it is $1,998. Okay. One is for one is for the children's section and one is for the adult section. Okay, very good. So with that, uh, can I get a motion to approve this formally at this meeting? Where's Katie? I need that motion. <laughs> I 
Nobody wants encyclopedias. Okay, oh, Kath. Kath sorry, Kath sorry, I was gonna just let Kathy do it because she wrote it up. <laughs> Kathy, that's your motion. Yeah, I move that the board recommends that the mayor's signature be authorized on one Empson check in the amount of one thousand nine hundred ninety-eight dollars to World Book Encyclopedia for the purchase of two sets of encyclopedias. Do I get a second? I'll second. Very good. All in favor? I think that's everyone. So um, would you please kindly note, Catherine, there was unanimous support for that language. And could you get that language, please, in the minutes? Can someone send it to me in text, like in actual form I can copy? Is there a way to email it to me? Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. This is Nicole. Yes, Catherine, I'll get it over to you. Is that, that's okay, Mark, that I send it to yeah, you? Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. You bet. Thank you, Nicole. Of course, guys. And then uh, I thought it would be good for the board to know how much money was in the Empson fund. Okay, well, there's, there's quite a bit of money in the Empson fund. Not all of it is available at this point. But the total market value, according to the last report that I had, which was September 2020, we get you know nice thick reports with all the investments in there, is two million eight hundred and twenty-seven thousand one hundred nineteen dollars and eighty-six cents. That's as that's as of September, and that's the last we get quarterly report. So I can um, tell you what the cat the cash equivalent is about twenty one is twenty one thousand and $69.43. It has a million seven in equity, a little over a million seven in equity. Fixed income taxable amount is 1,012,291, real assets 69,517. So I can send that out to people. Yeah, uh, please, uh, at, at least to Catherine so we can get it in the notes. I will send, the I'll, I'll send her the exact numbers. Okay, wonderful. Any other questions with respect to the Empson Fund decision or the discussion around it? I'm just curious what it is. Oh, okay. Nancy, you want to explain that? No, I don't know the whole history of this particular fund, actually. You know, most of these are just are long since established endowment funds that we have. And some of, some of the funds that we have were established for specific purposes, and some of them were just general. So... So my my recollection and and um, the, those that have been on the board for a while can correct me, but I I thought it was an endowment from quite quite a while ago, and it, it is had a modest beginning, but because it was never touched, and in in um, truth was lost within the true. city's um, accounting. <laughs> Uh, records that it had prospered and it had done quite well. And it seems like it's continuing to do quite well. It, it is doing quite well. Like, you know, what from what the reports look like, it is doing quite well. Um, we do actually, they've changed a little bit the way the, uh, some of the proceeds are distributed. So we do actually receive checks, which we turn around and, you know, deposit with the city cashier monthly. But, but before, apparently, I think, you know, to my understanding, it's similar to what you you just expressed that, you know, for a long time, they never saw the checks, there were direct deposits into the fund and it kind of disappeared and grew. And, and I guess folks thought that it would not be as much as it was because it was quite conservatively invested, but it's done very well, so. Well, and it was originally, it was set up to be only used on reference materials. And so, over kind of the years that kind of been like, well, what is a reference material? Yeah. And can we use it for X, Y, Z? Can we say that, you know, so that's also kind of earmarked for that specifically, you know. That was really typical we... with this type of funds. We have one fund that, that like this was set up for reference. And then we have another fund, which we might be confusing, Mark. The other fund that I think grew more than people thought was originally set up for materials for the visually impaired. Right. And, but, you know, over time when someone sets something up and then it's 40 years later, 
And, you know, things have changed. You know, there used to be really specialized equipment in libraries that was used for the visually impaired before we had the ability just to turn on a computer and change the font size. And that's basically what the, what the expensive equipment did. So, um, yeah, a lot of these do change over time, but it's always uh, a really nice blessing when you find out you had more than you thought you did. <laughs> In some of these funds and what was the name of the other fund you know i'm trying to now I'm, I'm totally blanking out but it'll come to me as soon as the meeting no, I, I, sure. I definitely remember the the purpose of it so there was i think at one point prior, probably prior to catherine coming on the board some discussion about going back to the empson folks and seeing if we could get more latitude i think that was the other fund the other fund that we were talking about that was for the visually impaired but We'll, I'll sort them out. It did It did make me wonder when you were saying, like, how do we define it? Because like you said, some of these materials that you've been able to get through the CARES Act are kind of a one-time only purchase, mm -hmm. probably. But mm -hmm. something like one of those tablets that you were describing sounds like a reference material, right? I mean, there might be some- Yeah, there's a pretty loose definition of reference material. And also, you know, obviously when these funds were established, you know, libraries still had giant sections filled with reference books which, you know, now most libraries have, you know, a teeny weeny little set of shelves with reference materials if you're a public library, because yeah. you can get so many more things online. So, so it's, yeah, it's it just interesting. makes me wonder if we end up having to replace any of those, you know, there'll probably be some wear and tear on those kind of things as they get loaned out. That might be a will be. To go to. Well, you keep most of the reference stuff in house, right? It's all no, I'm talking about the, the tablets that are preloaded oh, with materials, oh. like learning materials. Yeah, those those will be, I'm sure, you know, obsolete before we know it, just like everything else. But I will say our biggest challenge with this Empson Fund request was was trying to find where the Empson Fund checkbook was because we haven't used it since Debbie was there, and we found it um, very safely locked in the bottom of one of our three safes. So. Finally, after looking everywhere, high and low in every locked door, we're like, it's in the safe. It's in the safe we never go in. So, Well, uh, Councilman Waters, hold your ears on this. But there was, uh, when we were talking about this before, there was concern that with this amount of money that it would be raided by the city for the general fund. And we were, we were concerned that then that, that resource would be lost to the library. And so far, we've been lucky in that regard. Well, we'd we'd like to rate it as we talked about before. We'd like to rate it for you know. And finally, now that we're past, or when we are past dealing with mostly COVID all day every day, we would like to resume our electronic sorter search and installation. So that is something we well, talked well, about. Well, the board, will, the board at that time will look forward to getting that request. We're talking this year, Mark. So. I'm with you. I would Mark, Mark, I think okay. it was the Mosier Fund, the Mosier family. It was the Mosier Fund. Yeah, Thank, you. Mosier Thank you. Thank you. And um, my recollection, the last time I checked, I, I think there was like five hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars of, of, of spending authorization. Yes. Um, and the concern was that if you exer if the, this board exercised that option, the city would then pull back that amount of money, right? That's the way it would be rated. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I, I I have to tell you, I. I I seriously doubt that would happen. Uh, I know this group, and I think the friends of the library, and I personally uh, would take a great exception. I would, would I would make it so painful for the city to do that. They'd never want to do it again. I, I can promise you. Um, but that 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 money, while the, the fund was dedicated for the purposes of servicing the visually impaired, it was my imp my understanding from my conversation with Jim that that this board had the author the authority to to redirect that. And, you know, it could be that we would go back and we would need to make a recommendation to council, but I don't think so. I don't think there's anybody left in the Mosier family to go back and confer with. This was like, this has been, you know, for so long. So I do think you have those degrees of freedom and I'm happy to follow that up in any way that might be helpful when the time comes. But, um, but, you, but you've got that in your back pocket, right? And, uh, oh, on behalf on behalf of this board or a future board, it, it might be good to know that, so that if we were to pull that trigger, that we wouldn't legally complicate the life of the city or the library specifically 
if the board was to take that sort of action. I'm happy to follow that up if you want me to. Yeah, if you don't mind, if, uh, unless somebody else has an objection to it, I guess it, it's, it's only in our best interest to know what our prerogatives are because this board won't stay the same, nor will council stay the same, and the dynamics can change. And um, you'd like to have some thoughtful um, management on the distribution of those monies. I'll follow it up. Please. That would be really that would be really helpful as we have several ideas for, you know, how what, how we could make some. Um, space planning and technology improvements to our current building to um, render it a little bit more modern than its 30 year old self. So. Very good. Well, let's let's do as, as suggested. Let's understand what our prerogatives are because I'm sure there's plenty of needs out there and um, how we, how we thoughtfully meet those needs will be a challenge for this board and any others. Um, so that's all I have on that, unless there are other questions or uh, concerns. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda was uh, a follow-up question to uh, the councilman's question on the role of his liaison ship or whoever else would come on from council as a liaison. Did, um, did you get any additional comments? No, Mark, I got your input and I appreciate it. And I'll just say again to the members of this board, there is nothing in writing. Um, there's no suggestions. There's no job description. There's no checklist. There's not a set of bullet points. There is nothing when people come on to the council that, that would inform how they approach the role of liaison. So you're told or you know, assigned, you're gonna be the liaison to fill in the blank to the library advisory board. Um, and then you make it up as you go along. Um, and, and maybe that's okay, but we certainly don't, we don't say that to you, right? To the members of boards and commissions, we've raised the standards, the council has. We've set attendance requirements. We've created a, a little more rigorous interview process, even though it's only five minutes for, for most boards and commissions, now it's 10 minutes longer for some. And there are higher standards for getting applications in on time and those kinds of things. But as a council, we've created more accountability for you and never addressed. So what's our role in all that in terms of making certain what we're doing adds value to what you do? So, um, you know, I, I, pride, I raised this question with the council and there wasn't much interest, but just for the boards and commissions I'm liaison to, it would be helpful to know. And, if, and to the degree that any of that's generalizable to other boards and commissions, I'd be, if I got feedback, I'm gonna share it and, um, and, and maybe others would take a look at what it is that we should be doing. Uh, and if you're making it up as you go along and it's okay, that's fine. Um, I'm not looking to criticize anybody. I just think we ought to have a, uh, a, a at least a, a set of standards with which to start when people come onto the council to say, here's what, here's what you deserve from us, because we're pretty clear about what the city deserves from you. So, so do, is there anything? Um, has there ever been anything, or is there anything in the works? by this council that says, we want to um, address this liaison relationship across all boards. Like, no, is that's, there what, I was, I was, that's what I was suggesting we do. And, and there wasn't much of an interest on the part of the rest of the council. Okay, so, so and, and on your other boards, have they produced anything usable at this point that we could take advantage of? Not yet. Okay. But I have a meeting Thursday night. I haven't had a chance to ask this question yet of the of the neighborhood group leaders and uh, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. I have asked that question. Don't have any feedback yet. Katie? Yeah, I just have a, because prior to you uh, on this board, we actually didn't really hear. I mean, the li liaison, of course, came to the meetings, but 
they didn't participate that much in the meetings. They were mostly just there. And if we had questions, we had to be more proactive about it. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I think, Al, I don't think it's probably a part of every board's minutes that the liaison actually has a section where they talk about things that are pertinent to that board. So, I mean, I think that in particular for us has been very helpful. Like the city council meetings are very lengthy and they cover a lot of topics and some of it's related to the library, but certainly not all of it's related to the library. And I do think it's very helpful to have that part of the meeting where you specifically talk about what's pertinent to that board. So I think that's been helpful, at least for our board. I, I'm certain it's not across the board of all other boards. So I just thought I'd mention that. Well, if any of you individually or collectively have additional comments for the councilman, I would encourage you to send them on because it's not often you have someone that's receptive to hearing advice and concerns and criticisms. And I, this is a great time to get that out in front so we can all try and figure out how to build a better model of this arrangement. So if you if have, please send them on. If there's any reticence, like, uh, yeah, I have a really have a strong opinion. You want to do more of this or less of that, and and you don't want to hurt my feelings. Uh, you know, you'd you'd have to go a long way to hurt my feelings based on what we the kind of input we get from the public. But if you could share that with Mark, because Mark has no qualms about hurting my feelings, he's just going <laughs> to tell me that. Or to Nancy. Um, so if it's easier to do it that way, I just think if we could build a collective understanding across boards and commissions, what is it that we should be doing that adds value to your work? Because that's the whole reason that we're assigned as liaisons. And we just don't, we just never had a conversation about it. And uh, it just seemed to be like it's we ought to, given the fact that we've raised the expectations for you, that we ought to be uh, setting an example of how to raise expectations and meet them, so. I, I have one um, thought that, um just occurred to me, but you know, you've been great about encouraging that, that communication from you to us. What other boards do you see come to you through council that, uh, that administer their function more effectively than this board does? Um, yeah, and that's a good question, Mark. I, I think, um, I don't, I honestly, I would not, I don't think there is a better example. I think I think you've done a terrific job as chair. I think the input this board is, it, it's, this is a fun board to be a liaison to, both because of because it's the library and because you all bring your own passion about the library and, and um, you, all, you value it as much as you know, any patron in town. That's part of what makes it fun, um, that you're not reticent about providing input to one another. You take on responsibilities as volunteers outside of this meeting. Um, I wish, I wish there were some other boards I wish were as active as you are in terms of helping to, uh, to, to move an agenda or you know, to, uh, consistent with mission of the library. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't say, yeah, take a look at, you know, at, at the Parks and Rec Board or um, you know, the Historic Preservation Committee or any of the other boards and commissions that I'm familiar with. I, I, you ought to feel good in, in my opinion about what you do, how you come at it. And I think, Mark, you've been, I think, chair for as long as I've been the liaison. And, uh, and I think you do, your leadership of this group has been terrific. Well, thanks for those words. You have my condolences for our time together. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, the invitation is open. I think we're, all, we're all interested in learning and figuring out how to do yeah. this. Well, that's what it's all about. We have to learn our way forward. And I just, we haven't been quite as intentional enough about it, in my view, on the council side of this, so. Okay, very good. So did we, um, do we uh, address all that bullet was intended to address or are there additional items out there that we want to throw on the table? Hearing none, I'll um, move on to the next item here. Status of activities regarding phase two of the feasibility study. Is there any update on that, Nancy, that you'd have for us? There isn't much at the moment with us trying to fit, 
you know, fit all the year end stuff in, except that we are, uh, I have dredged up the original consultant RFP. I don't have it with me at the moment, but we're going to be you know, looking for that consultant to do the financial modeling portion of the feasibility study. So um, you know, if we have one or two members of council that would love to proofread our newest version that we're coming up with of our next phase, we will be discussing that at a, an upcoming board meeting as well. So we're in the process now of looking at looking at this RFP for the next phase and we'll be obviously talking with our um, wonderful purchasing department about what that RFP looks like. But you want board support on that? I wanna, will. Okay. I mean, do you want uh, feedback or... Uh, uh, well, I'd love to know. I mean, if anyone is against us continuing with the study and figuring out what that data extrapolates into for, for you know, the different options moving forward to fund some of those things that have been uh, laid out in the consultant's results. Um, then, you know, if you want to do a formal measure of any well, kind of support for us moving forward, that would be awesome. I didn't, um, I didn't uh, have anything specific in mind, but you, you had mentioned that you were going to have council take a look at it. And um, yeah, we're just not there yet. We're not done with. If it's with, in that form, uh, you know, I think some of us would, would, be happy to take a look at it as well and mm -hmm. provide feedback as, as you felt it was needed. So mm -hmm. I'll leave that out as an open. So what we're doing with that is, is you know, a couple of different things right now um, that we're just starting to pick at really is to look at how we, uh, at what exactly we're looking for in a consultant moving forward. We know what the original consultant had intended to hire out to a second consultant um, but we would like to have more say over that than, than them passing it on to someone to do the, the financial modeling. So, um, you know, really just, just considering what it is that we want them to do with all the data that the, that the first consultant gathered. And um, really want to be pretty stringent because I think we, we expect a little bit more out of the first phase of the feasibility study. So I want to be a lot more stringent this time about what kind of analysis we're really looking for and what kind of presentation we're looking for. Great. So um, that's where we are right now is just trying to, to work that. And also I've been making some calls and reaching out to some contacts to, to try and find a list of names when we have this prepared to send it to of consultants that we feel have experience doing this. From your background, and this is, this is, mm -hmm. uh, really part of the next step. From your background, do you have uh, experiences or recommendations that, that you would put in front of the board that says this is a good way to interact with council over the results of this? So, so there's you know, some census that- I do have some experience you. with this, but um, it, it's a little bit different because my uh, experiences in working with this type of a project have um, been, been with a, an advisory board, even though the libraries were, were not with an advisory board, were rather with a governing board, even though the libraries were city, city and municipal libraries, they had a governing board rather than an advisory board. So the role and the responsibilities were a little bit different. So I'm going to have to think about that one. Well, if, if you have any, uh, recommendations from your past, I, you know, we'd love to hear it because, mm -hmm. I, I keep turning this over in my mind, and I'm sure the other board members do too, is that, okay, we're gonna have these results that are gonna come to us from, from the consultants. Council's gonna see them. The board's gonna have an opinion mm -hmm. based on just the interactions that we go through monthly. Council's gonna have an opinion, but it's not clear whether the two opinions are gonna be the same and that the potential to, to have this thing drop into, uh, you know, a coal yes. mine, and never come yeah. back out again is, is real. And I, what, I don't want to see that happen. What typically happens and what I would expect to happen and I would build into the provisions of this second set of responsibilities for this consultant. Um, and the one that I worked with last in Bellingham was that they um, came on site and met with the board pretty extensively 
went through everything prior to presenting it to council. And the consultant was, you know, were the ones that took input from the board and various other entities and then and then um, refined their presentation and presented it to council. Well, that's great <laughs> having the board's um, viewpoints on their study presented as part of the study, but it doesn't it doesn't close the gap between council's state of mind and the opinion of the board and the study that would be presented to council. And I'm, I'm just trying to find mechanisms to keep the process going. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're spending 50 plus thousand yeah. dollars on this to try and find answers. And you would like to think that the money's not wasted. Mm -hmm. And that we have we have some sort of consensus that both groups agree to, and then that, that creates the path forward kind of thing. Well, I guess I've been lucky because it it's worked out okay in the ones I've been involved with in in that the council um, the councils that were involved um, took in the information as presented, you know, and asked a lot of questions, and then proceeded in a way that benefits the library. I'm sure it doesn't always. Um, that's, I have to think about that, about yeah, what happens when that doesn't I, happen. I, I think you've got a wealth of, of hard-won experience that you can mm -hmm. keep, keep us safe with, um, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Do you have any thoughts on this, Councilman? Well, I, I, I have a couple thoughts. Um, is it safe to say, Nancy, that you're disappointed in the consultants or consulting firm and you know it's not it is not what we expected it to be and I think you know the thing is we started out with Kimberly Bull and an associates and it was a husband and wife team and he had the um, expertise in compiling data and doing those type of things and she had the library experience and the two of them split up personally and professionally um, possibly even before we hired them even though that's not how it was presented I'm not sure but um, you know, I felt like something was missing because we never saw Kimberly Bolin from Kimberly Bolin and Associates after the interview. So I did feel like at least initially it was quite disjointed and not organized the way I would have liked it to have been. I did feel like our staff did a lot of the front work on this project, and you know, I'm not opposed to doing that, but I'm sort of opposed to paying someone a lot of money to do it and having us do it. Yeah. Um, I think there were some areas that where they excelled. I think that the community surveying, um, the paper survey and the analysis of that was very good. I think the first part and the last part of the um, consultants project are very well done. I do feel like they, um, they were pretty good at synthesizing things at the end. Um, I didn't feel that they were as proactive as some, some folks I've worked with before in, in that, you know, for example, you know, we have um, several spots in the, the survey data where you know, it notes what percentage of our population is um, Spanish speaking, but doesn't extrapolate anything saying, well, you need to serve people more and this is a significant percentage of your population and here's how you might do it. So I felt like there were some of those things that are open-ended. Um, what I would expect from this second phase would be to take this, a lot of this raw data from the first phase. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I've had consultants that do all of this, but in this case, um, I'd like it to move in a, a more definitive direction than I feel like the other one was a little bit loosey goosey. So I would like to have a consultant's um, results presented in the way that I've had them in the past with some uh, really great data and you know data extrapolation and charts and graphs that show the different funding possibilities going forward of you know like you've said you know it's not going to it's not it's not like you can build this library system of the future for a growing population with with nickels and dimes so if you're going to need funding here are the different funding mechanisms here's what they cost overall here's what it costs for you the taxpayer to do these different these different you know options for funding. Um, it's funding and its governance. You know, it's funding, it's it's taking in, into account the raw data. What does this look like for a library district? What does this look like for, muni for a municipal library? You know, what are the what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I was I was hoping they would get more into that in phase one. 
you know, because there are distinct advantages to disadvantages and there are hybrids. So they did mention, yes, there are hybrids, but they didn't say what the hybrids are. So uh, like, for example, in my last city, which is very similar to this, um, definitely a municipal library, not a district library, but with the governing board, which actually gave us more flexibility when it came to things like contracts and policy. Yeah. So, um, it, which, which, which we struggle with occasionally here. So um, that's one option. You know, there are all yeah. there are multiple different hybrid options. And, you know, maybe it's one of those things where you don't ever want to do the consultants work for them because you want an outside opinion, but, but I sort of want to go and talk mm -hmm. to the next person and say, you know, here are options that we have seen. We want data on how these would work. Plus what else do you know? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's like, you got the what, that's the data. You didn't get the, so what? You didn't get the, so what? No. <laughs> which no. is what you'd expect from a consultant. So, so, here's ho a, so hopefully, a, hopefully um, I know a couple of consultants that I've worked with before, and I'm sure there are others out there too, that, that can, can take what we have, which is considerable amount of data and make it into a, so what? So as you do that, uh, the, I would suggest if you haven't had any conversation with Tony Chacon, uh, you know, was Nancy Rezac was the point was the point person on the performing arts and conference yeah. center our, a feasibility study that the, with Nancy leaving that got shifted to Tony. I don't know how much of a role Tony's playing. I'm told um, that he's just kind of the point person that fields okay. the question or whatever. Now that's not. Um, there are different views on how that's playing out, but I've been in a, ser mm -hmm. a series of recent conversations about that feasibility study. And, yeah. and here's, yeah. what, here's what I think you should be concerned about. Mark, this goes back to you know, what, what the gaps in understanding or how much bandwidth the council would have. You're gonna have two feasibility studies. What I think you'd like to do is have them come in about the same time, yep. right? And there ought to be a real thoughtful coordination in terms of when and how the results of both get presented to the council. Mm -hmm. I think there should be some really strategic uh, conferring between mm -hmm. Mark and you in this board mm -hmm. and Elliot uh, Moore and uh, mm -hmm. Bob um, Balsam and Lapai. Um, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, uh, there's a, there is a, I think a unique opportunity because of both feasibility studies to bring this home in a way for both studies and the interest mm -hmm. for all the groups involved in a way that will never come along again, mm -hmm. right? Not any of our lifetimes, mm -hmm. but it's gonna have to be timed and, and thoughtfully um, uh, integrated in terms of how it all gets uh, presented to the council and to the community. Um, but there's an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. And I'm a, I've got a phone going off in the background, you hear a buzz. Um, uh, but I, so I do think, Check it with Tony on the timing on the other. Okay. Using that to kind of uh, to calibrate what mm -hmm. your deadlines would be for your consultant, mm -hmm. and then making certain you're in close uh, uh, proximity or in close mm -hmm. collaboration with uh, the Lapai group and mm -hmm. the other staff members who are involved in that feasibility study. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to you, you uh, how that gets timed and and how they both get presented to the council and then what. We'll, what we might be able to do in the community becomes real important. That makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense because there are so many overlaps so that are possible yeah. there. So clarify the name of the other feasibility study, please. It's the arts. It's the it's a performing arts and conference center feasibility Thanks. study. Yeah. yeah. And and the truth is, I um, uh, the folks who are the the interested parties in Longmont who have been working with those consultants, they're not real happy with that consulting firm either. So it's a little discouraging to find out we got two feasibility studies that we got that we're disappointed, I think, in, in both consulting efforts. Um, I, there's nothing to do about that at this point in time, except yeah. make lemon, lemonade out of what otherwise yeah. might be lemons. Um, I, but I do think uh, you ought to have an eye on their de deadline, as you said, a, a deadline mm -hmm. for, the, for the modeling. And, um, and then think real hard about how do we bring these together? And I'm mm -hmm. happy to confer with you on that, how and when to bring them to the council so that the bandwidth the council has available, they get a chance mm -hmm. to get the gestalt of this and understand if there's strategies that need to be in play 
between the two studies and, and what we eventually would want to put before the community. Well, I think that's something we really do want to look at. And, you know, the consultants had spoken with, for example, with museum staff, et cetera, before, but then they didn't really do anything with what we talked to with them. And, and you know, that is definitely another option moving forward. And, you know, if we were to look at some type of a district, there's no saying that it would have to be a library, just, it just if you're a library district, there are library and museum districts, there are library and cult, there are cultural arts districts, yeah. there are all kinds of different hybrid options. So yeah. we just didn't get those hybrid options out of, out of this. I think we have really good library data, which can contribute to that. But I think, I think we definitely need to talk to them about any options that may involve a, you know, a greater entity than just the library. Well, you know, there's a keen interest in the community. Yes. In how to, how to move this forward and how yeah. to do something big, right? Like go big or go home. Yeah. We'd like to do something big. So is, is anything bubbling up through Envision Longmont? I mean, is, are there any different visions that would work against the direction and the flow of what this is tending to suggest? No, I don't think it'll be through Envision Longmont. Um, uh, not that there isn't work that doesn't get done, but that's, I mean, that's, that, that's the comprehensive plan. Um, mm -hmm. It's not static, but it's, there's not a lot of active visioning in the context of Envision Longmont. I think where it's likely to happen, Mark, is we have money in the budget to, to reinvigorate the STEAM initiative. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll happen there, mm -hmm. right? And it's in that context, I think that we need to bring all this together uh, around um, land acquisition, land aggregation, and, you know, and, and what's the, what, what is it we wanna ask the community and, and where are the partners the, in terms of the private sector? Because I think both for, through the friends and from the, the, those with deep pockets who support the arts, there's an interesting public-private partnership to be created here. Mm -hmm. the, change, the change in our charter enables this in ways that, that were not available before. All the thinking that's come into the, gone into the STEAM project, what's mm -hmm. gonna happen with turning all that visioning into planning documents this year, I mean, along comes now this opportunity with these two visibility studies, it's gonna happen one time, right? And we need to seize that opportunity. So- um, No pressure. <laughs> well, there, it's a hell of an opportunity. It is, uh, I think it's great. So the timing of our phase two, what do you think the timing would look like for our phase two? Me or Tim? Well, uh, since since you probably know more, I'll, I'll ask you. Well, we can, you know, we can set parameters. I think that, you know, since, since I kind of know what we want to come out of phase two, and I've worked with consultants doing this before, but, you know, since we did have a lot of the raw data and community surveying done by, by our first consultant, I don't think the time frame will be particularly wide in this case, it's not gonna be as long as if we were starting from scratch. What would you guess second quarter, first quarter? If, if I, would, you, I would assume we'd hire somebody hopefully in January, if that's not too optimistic. And I would say it would probably take them a couple of months to complete this, depending so on- second, what quarter, second quarter, likely. I'm hoping perhaps. so, I, th I would think so. Okay, and uh, I guess you'll find out through your conversations what the timing of the other study is going to look like. So we will uh, see where it goes. Okay, any other thoughts on on this topic? I, this is going to be something we're going to have to continue to grind away on. But I think this is good stuff. I mean, this is this is exciting stuff if we can pull it off. Okay, uh, I'll move on to um, new business then. Um, we didn't really have a, um, a topic for little libraries on, on this agenda. Mm -hmm. And I didn't add anything under new business because it occurred to me in the interim. But I was driving around town and I was looking at all these um, private little libraries mm -hmm. 
that that are popping up everywhere, which I think are, is really great. And uh, I just wanted to throw out a thought or two about maybe an alternative way of, of trying to skin the cat that we're trying to skin here. Um, you know, we, we built, we built the couple little libraries that the library sponsored. we we funded them with books. Um, we had a flow, we had a, a, a workforce that would, would, um, take care of them and all that. But I was wondering if, if we were able to put something out either through the friends or through the library that said, okay, if you have a little library, we're willing to work with you in terms of, of making sure that you have enough books to be in that little library. So that kind of gets the board out, gets, gets the library out of the day-to-day -day stuff, maybe uh, intercedes the friends instead of the library from an administrative standpoint. But when all these books come in and, and they get segregated for sale or whatever, there's always some that are left over that, that don't get picked up. And um, maybe at that point in the process, we can say those needy little homegrown little libraries, we're willing to help you. What do you guys think about that? Is that, is that Councilman? Councilman? I just would suggest you think about the Na Neighborhood Group Leaders Association. You've got like 56 neighborhoods, right? Or 66 in Longmont that are all part of NGLA. And, and most, if, where you'll find the, the private uh, small libraries, um, are in their pocket parks or in somebody, you know, posted in somebody's front yard where they have eyes on it. And, they, you know, they, they police it more than the ones that were posted in public parks, right? Where nobody, yeah. and if you want to make it kind of a seamless way to do it, talk to Wayne about getting this in front of NGLA. My guess is they'd love to work with the library board. I don't know. I mean, I, I contacted them multiple times. I contacted Wayne about the problems we had with our little free libraries before, and I never got a response. Well, there's a meeting Thursday night, and I, I get time on that agenda. I'm happy to make that part of my agenda, if you want, to ask that I, question. Well, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of intrigued by Mark's idea, though, because we do always have, you know, a plethora of stuff that's not quite good enough for the book sale, but that, you know, there's a bunch of, I, I passed like four of them on my way through Longmont driving home. It and all those books just go to a vendor that, you know, turns around and does whatever the vendor does with them. So why not keep them in the community? I think that's kind of intriguing because I think there's a lot of them that people have, you know, they probably st struggle a little bit to stock them. Be I think it'd be worth talking to the friends about and see if we... Do you think it should go to the friends before it goes to the NGLA? Maybe. Because they'd be the ones that I, I think I could see this working really well through the friends because they they were fabulous through COVID at pulling a ton of books for us to give away at the free lunch giveaway spots, et cetera. So I, I think that um, they have some really great volunteers that work on the sorting that would, you know, look for it, look for a good assortment of materials to be to be sent out to these folks or put aside for folks to come in and pick up for their free libraries. I think that's an interesting idea. Well, would you uh, mind mentioning that at the next meeting? And, no, I would love to. And see if there's any interest at all. I'm, I'm sure that's... If there isn't, then, we're, then we go to plan B. Put the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. You know, some libraries even put them out at their branch. You know, I've had them at my library branches before. And it seems weird, but you know we're not open 24/7, so we did have a few issues with people putting library books in them. But um, you know the idea was to be somewhere accessible with cameras. Well, I won't mention anything in GLA. Not yet. Yeah. But thank you. Thanks for the thought. That's ultimately. Um, a good way to spread it if we can get the mechanism to um, be the back the back end side of distributing the books. Um, another item I had under new business is um, the member appointment 
And I didn't know whether you were kidding earlier or not, Katie. Are you staying with us or, or is there a new, you are going to stay with us? Oh, great. So then this will be the board going forward for the next year or so. Great. So then um, next meeting, we should have an officer vote. So get your campaign slogans and your your ads going and your uh, you know your uh, placards and all the rest of it and your supporters, and we'll um, we'll do the officer vote in January. That's great. Does that mean there's no new blood to voice the secretarial duties onto? <laughs> we'll we'll work we'll work it out on uh, the next meeting. Actually, it's the twenty fifth. So. We'll give you plenty of time on the podium to uh, make the case. <laughs> Vote myself? <laughs> to plea. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm thrilled that Katie is staying because I think this is a really good board. I think you're a really good combination of, of a lot of great qualities and passion for the library. So I would, since there is a lot of stuff that's going to be going on in the next your year and a half or so, I'm very pleased that you're all still with us as a group, because I think I see great things coming in our future. So I like to think so as well. Makes me really happy. I think it's been, an, it's been great for me to work with such supportive people over the last year or so, and I, th I think we're moving the ball forward. So from my perspective, it's been wonderful. Do you, um, do you want to send along your thoughts, Cynthia, in terms of what you might be interested in going forward, since you're not going to be here? I'll do that. Um, so I can email, I guess you would make the most sense, Mark. Is that right? Well, I'll get it in front of the group, or you can get it to Nancy, and she'll get it in front of the group. But at least at least when we, we nominate you for all these jobs and you end up with them, that well, from you'll have a say in it. She'll be lucky if we don't make her baby the secretary. So. Has experience. <laughs> um, Mark, can we go back briefly to the free little library conversation? Sure. Um, one comment I did want to make during that is my understanding part of the original idea was to get out to some more underserved areas of the community. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, I, I, I think the idea is really exciting of uh, reaching out to um, people who already have these setups, but I'm wondering if there's a way to also make sure that our efforts are to areas where people may not be um, frequent library patrons. And so I'm assuming that that could be part of the conversation with the, I forget what's called the group, uh, neighborhood group association. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that would be an interesting an important thing to keep in mind during that conversation. Yeah, point, point well made. Uh, mm -hmm. can, can we get that in the notes, please, Catherine, so we remember that that's the game plan? Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll look forward to, to your thoughts on um, officer positions, or you can send it on to Nancy if you feel more comfortable. Can I, ask a, uh, can I ask a question, of, of just following up on this? Have we ever put little free libraries inside buildings, like in El Comite's office, or do we have one in the youth and family? We put it, we put it inside the youth services, and it's still there. So that one's still inside the youth services building. And is there one inside Sandstone? I think it's inside Sandstone. That's not ours. I don't know where, where is it at at Sanso? <laughs> I thought there was like a little community area and it was, it was there. Or did they, they okay. Well, El Comite, okay. El Comite and the Hour Center would both be places you could put little free libraries inside a building where you didn't have to worry about vandalism and they would be accessible to populations that are typically less well served. Yeah, I had mentioned the Hour Center before, Tim, because I we had had a couple in our equivalent to that, to the Hour Center in Bellingham, and it worked out really well. And, you know, folks are doing a lot of sitting around and waiting sometimes, and, you know, having having reading materials is really beneficial. I'd say the Hope well, offices, you would put, put that on your list as well. That's a good idea. And, and I would, I would um, 
propose that when you folks bring this up with the friends that you might inquire their interest in sponsoring. And I think, you know, we could, uh, I think it's, it's structure inside. Of yeah, I think this could be a great combination because I think, you know, we could put something inside one of these buildings that would serve some folks that um, would probably like and, and appreciate some access to these materials. But at the same time, you know, it's not putting it on their staff in these buildings to, to stock these stations. So I think the friends could stock them. Yeah, I mean, if they, wanted, if they wanted to put together the initial library and stick it in the hour center as an example, mm -hmm. and, we, and we had a mechanism either through the library or through them to keep it funded with books, I, I think that's a win-win for the community if, if we can... That'd be really you know, simple, too. I mean, that's, that's you well. know, we walk over there all the time for meetings, et cetera. It's three blocks from us, so cut through the parking lot. There are typically folks looking to do service projects too, if we needed help with construction. Mm -hmm. Like that's Eagle. a really good idea. Cause I know there've been some, I've seen Eagle Scout projects and some other things like that, that, yeah. that do a lot of work with those. So. All good ideas. Okay, great. Um, that's all I had for new business. Um, I, I did want to uh, open up the library board comments for um, some thoughts from Catherine on her project on the Kudo boards. But do, you, do we have any other um, items for new business before we move along? I don't see anybody's hands up. So um, would you mind spending a couple minutes, Catherine, if you if you don't mind updating? I mean, it, it made the paper, so congratulations. It was a nice article. That was, it was, it's a good it's a good um, pat on the back activity, and I, I applaud you for your efforts for pulling it all together. Oh, if thanks. You, yeah, young kids are so techy. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm used to being the oldest one in the room, so it's kind of nice to have that perspective. <laughs> Um, no, I certainly don't want it to be about me at all, but I just am pleased that it got some traction in the community. And Nancy, you said that you felt it was, you know, well received with your staff and gave them a little boost, which I think we could all use right now. So I was, you know, just approached by the Longmont leader, um, reporter, and I, I reached out to Nancy and Mark just to let them know. I think that was sort of the protocol we had agreed to. So, you know, it was a very brief conversation and, he took down a few of my thoughts. I, I did try to put a plug in for the fact that, you know, the staff makes do with so much less funding than most of that. <laughs> so just try to lay that groundwork there for us, you know. Um, but mostly I, I just, the board is still open. So I hope it will invite more people to share, the, share their love and appreciation for this team that has really gone above and beyond. And um, I, like I said in the, in the article, just probably doesn't get a lot of, um, direct light shown on it all the time so it made it was me really it was really nice for staff and you know among us we recognize most of the patrons who made comments because oh we we know and love our patrons so <laughs> that was and actually the community you know outside of a few cranky folks you know and we understand they're under a lot of stress now um we love our patrons and they uh, they actually express their gratitude often you know the ones especially since we went you know off into the the dangerous red zone, et cetera. Um, I know the Longmont leader had had put what what was a, a correct article, but their headline when we went to the red zone was library closed. And what it then explained in the article was that it was closed for browsing, but a lot of folks didn't go all the way into the article and they totally panicked. We had so many calls and so many people coming up saying, you're closed, we can't get materials anymore. And so they were so relieved that we weren't closed, that we were just taking a step back to curbside. So actually our patrons have been incredibly appreciative of that and, and um, continue to have a ton of seniors that use the library. We thought that it would be mostly the younger folks and the seniors would be, you know, holed up away from COVID. And instead, a lot of them have told us that this is their outing. So to come to the library. So we're, we're just, um, you know, we're grateful that we can provide at least some of what we have, but it was very, very 
beneficial to staff and it came at kind of a tough time. So I really thank you for doing that. Yeah, that's that's great, I, great idea. Um, at the uh, friends meeting coming up, do you think it's worthwhile mentioning this at the friends meeting in case they want to get on the board and express comments or whatever? Yeah, I think Kathy was going to forward it. I'm not sure if you ever had a chance to do that. I know I sent it to you at one point, just to everybody. And I think you might have already forwarded it to the friends. I didn't forward it specifically to the friends, but I did forward it to other of my friends. Actual so, friends. <laughs> actual friends, yeah. Uh, but I can certainly do that. I yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, they're obviously big boosters of the library and, you know, you would think the library staff as well. And, um, you know, they're, they're a bigger organization than our board. And, um, you know, they have tentacles in the community that we don't have. And maybe with their um, backing and, and their individual comments, that'll give an added boost to the staff. If you, you know, if you feel comfortable bringing it up. Yeah. I'll do it. Thank you. Very good. Okay, that's uh, that's all I have. Are there any other uh, comments or um, concerns or? Oh, wait, I have one more. Um, happy holidays, everybody. And I hope you have a, a wonderful one in this age of the virus and that you all socially distance in a responsible way, but party the hell out of the holiday and uh, we'll see you after the first of the year. And Any good luck, questions? Cynthia, if we don't, if we don't yeah. see you again. <laughs> Hopefully not in January. <laughs> What's happening to Cynthia? So you're gone. Oh, you missed it. Uh, but I'm having a baby in early oh. January, hopefully. Yeah. In early January, maybe sooner. <laughs> January, didn't you tell me January 9th? Was that when you told January me? January 9th, yeah. No. Yep. So I really hope I'm not at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be fuming if she's at the next meeting. But that's very mm -hmm. exciting. Uh, but the nice part, the nice part about these virtual meetings is that you can show us the baby at the virtual meeting. <laughs> <laughs> be <laughs> working on your future students, Catherine. <laughs> Future library user. Hopefully. That's exciting news. Very exciting. Um, Councilman, did you have something? No, I thought you I thought your hand was up. Okay. Well, great. Well, we'll we'll see you all after the first of the year. And what is our next meeting date, just to clarify? Uh it's January 25th. 25th. Thank you. Okay. Same I'm just time. so excited for it to be 2021. So. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nicole. Bye, Nicole. You're a trooper. You're welcome, gang. Take care. <laughs>